Hello, and welcome to the American Experiment, Conversations on Politics, Principles, and Education. I'm your host, John Agresto, member of the Jack Miller Center Board of Directors, author, longtime professor of American history and politics, and retired president of St. John's College in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Our topic today is subversion through education. That is the role of our educational institutions in fostering or undermining the principles of our great experiment in liberty and democracy. And it is a true pleasure to have this conversation with my sometimes colleague and always friend, Robert George. Robbie is the McCormick Professor in Jurisprudence and the founding director of the James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions at Princeton University. He's written numerous books and articles on constitutional law, ethics, and culture, and has held many distinguished positions throughout his career, including chairman of the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom, on the President's Council on Bioethics, and as a presidential appointee to the United States Commission on Civil Rights. Most importantly, he plays a mean banjo. Welcome, Robbie. Thank you, John. You're a dear old friend and comrade in arms. And what a pleasure it is to be working again with the Jack uh, Miller Center. Uh, I've had the pleasure on many previous opportunities to do projects with the Miller Center, and I've gotten to know Jack and Goldie as great friends. So it's a joy. Thank you. You and I first met at your extraordinary center at Princeton called, as I said before, the James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions. If I may, I'd like to pick up on those words, American Ideals and Institutions. I want to get your opinion on how the teaching of our ideals and our history is faring these days, especially at the K-12 level before our students even enter college. What I see in our young men and women coming out of high school and into college is an ignorance of American history, of the philosophy of the American founding, of the basic principles of the American civil order, which is both alarming and not their fault. If they don't know the basic principles of American Republican democracy, for example, it's not because they weren't paying attention. It's because nobody told them about those principles. No one instructed them. So maybe we could start by talking about the thing that's causing a good bit of concern these days, the uh, 1619 Project, sponsored by the New York Times. The curriculum for this project is, I'm told, being used in over 4,000 schools. I know that you and many others who teach American ideals and history have real concerns about this project and its influence on young students. But why? What's, what's the fuss all about? Anyone who's been a witness uh, uh, in a trial, in a court, knows that the witness swears to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And that's the business of academia as well. And this should be true at the elementary and secondary levels, as well as uh, at the level of higher education. We need to tell the truth, including the truth about slavery. We need to tell the whole truth about slavery, and we need to tell nothing but the truth. In other words, we can't add falsehoods for any re political reasons, uh, what we regard as religious or moral reasons, there is no excuse, there's no justification for ever telling anything but the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. The problem with the 1619 Project is that in key areas, what it teaches just isn't true. And that's the reason for rejecting it. We don't reject it because it's left wing. We don't reject it because it's social justice warrior oriented. Uh, we don't reject it because of the quality or characteristics of the people who are behind it. We reject it because it doesn't tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So that's it. I mean, we can't skew our account of American history or our account of the American founding, our account of the American Constitution for some political goal or social justice end or anything other than that. Our job is to tell the truth and make sure that our students understand the truth. Now, there are serious questions that need to be debated. 
There are truths we don't know or know fully. There are matters that are disputed among the greatest of historians, the greatest of constitutional scholars, the greatest of political scientists about the American founding. But there, John, what we need to do is invite our students into the conversation by exposing them to the best that has been thought and said on the competing sides of all the disputed issues. I mentioned earlier, inviting them into the disputes of the arguments between or among founders themselves, like the debate between Jefferson and Hamilton. There's nothing wrong with that. On the contrary, that's what we should be doing. So we shouldn't present history or American civics like catechism class, but we should make sure that we don't distort the facts in order to advance some political agenda, however noble we may think that political agenda is. That's, I, I, that's fascinating, Robbie. Uh, because I'm sure they would come back and say, uh, put aside the small uh, disputes, small historical disputes. Yeah. What we're aiming at is to make slavery and racial oppression sort of a central topic of understanding. Uh, and uh, they may say, you know, given the fact that slavery was for years a, a central part of our history, that racial oppression is hardly a minor matter, uh, and that even those people who gave us the ideals you're talking about, Washington, Jefferson, even James Madison, were owners of slaves. Uh, how do we, shouldn't we be telling them the side of the story other than ideals and principles and talk about the, uh, talk about the facts on the ground? Well, we shouldn't sugarcoat our history and we shouldn't whitewash our history. There are grave wrongs that were done, uh, not only against the slaves, uh, but also against indigenous American Indian tribes. Uh, there were many wrongs that were done. No, no point in denying that or glossing uh, over it. We should tell the story. But again, we need to tell the whole story. We need to tell the story of the struggle to overcome those injustices. We need to tell the story of the incompatibility or inconsistency between those injustices and the ideals to which we as a nation aspire. Uh, you're right. Jefferson wrote the words, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And yet the same Jefferson who wrote these words was himself a slaveholder. He was a hypocrite. He knew he was a hypocrite, too, because he knew that slavery was wrong. In speaking about slavery, Jefferson himself said, I tremble for my country when I consider that God is just and that his justice will not sleep forever. Now, I'll bet most of our high school students don't know that quotation from Jefferson, but they should, and wouldn't they be better off if they did so that they would understand the complex history? And if we believe, as I believe, in the truth and goodness of the principles, we shouldn't let the truth and goodness of those principles be obscured in any way by the failings or faults of the people who put those principles into our founding documents and made them the premises of the country. After all, it was only in the name of the Declaration and its core principles that Lincoln could make the case against slavery. Lincoln never, ever hesitated. He was constant in invoking the Declaration. And then, 100 years after that, Martin Luther King was equally vocal, uh, equally unfailing in invoking the Declaration of Independence and its principles. In fact, King said that the Declaration is like a promissory note. I always thought, what would have happened if we found ourselves as a country without the first and second paragraph of the Declaration of Independence, what kind of country would we be? We would be a nation like other nations. We would be a nation like the nations, for example, of old Europe. We would be a nation built on, founded on, integrated around blood and soil, or thrown an altar. Now, those are alternatives, and such nations aren't necessarily wicked or evil a nation built on ethnic loyalty or on uh, devotion to a king or a common uh, uh, culture or religion. There are such nations in the world. Some have flourished. They've been better and worse. We're an exceptional nation. 
because we are built on and integrated as a community, as a nation around not blood and soil or throne and altar, not shared culture, not shared religion, rather on a shared commitment to the principle that all human beings as members of the human family are created equal, that we are endowed with certain basic unalienable rights, what our founders didn't hesitate to call natural rights, God-given rights. So we may differ on religion, on politics. Uh, we may come from 200 different ethnic backgrounds or however many they are, but you can still be an American. We can still be united to each other out of our shared conviction uh, a belief in those principles. And that's what makes America truly exceptional. When we talk about American exceptionalism, John, we're not claiming we're better than other people because of our race or of our ethnicity. In fact, we're not claiming we're better than other people at all. What we're claiming is we're different, we're exceptional because we're not built on blood and soil or thrown an altar, but rather on a shared commitment to a creed, not a religious creed necessarily, but a creed, the principle of human equality, equal human dignity, basic human rights. The other thing that, that I hear a lot about these days when we talk about uh, pre-collegiate education is that uh, uh, the need to get back to teaching patriotism in our schools. And uh, that schools, are, we are, schools were always meant to produce or to help produce good citizens I wonder, I'd like to hear your thoughts about this. How do we go about without indoctrinating, without browbeating, without, without, and by enlightening, how do we make students into good citizens? By making them truth seekers. That's how we do it. By inculcating in them the virtues that are necessary to seek the truth. Uh, Madison said that only a well-educated people can be permanently a free people. Mm -hmm. And what he meant was, especially in a republic where people uh, govern themselves, and in a republic, of course, government is not only of the people, which all government is, or even only for the people, which all good government is, even if it's the government of a benign despot. The thing about republican government, government that makes it special is that it's government by the people. But if the people are to govern themselves, if we're to have government by the people, then the people have to be well educated in the principles of their government in the basic constitutional system. I think by nature, everyone loves his country. People are naturally patriotic. They love their, they love their families, they love their country, they hate to see people say bad things about it, and somehow they get untaught that natural love. So when teaching has an agenda, a political agenda, an ideological agenda, and shades off to, indoctrin to being indoctrination, well, then something has really gone astray. And there's just too much of that today. There's too much of it at the, um, at the uh, college level. And there's way too much of it, judging from what my students tell me about their experiences in middle school and high school, uh, in, uh, in those uh, educational levels. Um, so we shouldn't confuse education with activism. And teachers need to be taught to be good teachers not to be activists or to teach activism to their students. Now, there's nothing wrong with teachers having political opinions right. and, and, and getting involved in politics, standing up for causes and so forth, but they shouldn't be turning their classrooms into re-education camps uh, or uh, into uh, uh, political uh, party briefings or anything like that. Uh, they should understand that their role like my role as a university professor, is not to tell their students what to think or how to act in politics, but to help them to think better, to think more clearly, more deeply, and perhaps above all, for themselves. What we seem to be missing is independence of mind, independent thinking. And you will find that is missing whenever teaching has degenerated into indoctrination. It shouldn't be too hard to get back on track. I don't know that you have to teach patriotism. I think we do what you said. We have to teach the principles of America, teach what we've tried to accomplish, what we have accomplished, what we still want to accomplish. And they'll, and they'll say, okay, that's why I love the country. 
but uh, but I mean, that's been my I've been doing this for 35 years, mm -hmm. teaching constitutional interpretation, civil liberties, philosophy of law, moral and political philosophy. And my uh, experience is that when students are presented with the best that has been thought and said on the competing sides of the great political questions, the great questions of political philosophy, they come down in what I regard as the right way, certainly in the patriotic way. People who, uh, they become people who, uh, whose love of country is deepened by their understanding of the goodness of the country's principles. Their desire for reform then is not just an abstract revolutionary spirit, but rather is itself driven by their commitment to principles that aren't being honored faithfully enough in practice. I was going to ask what can philanthropists do to help, but I'm just going to say it. Philanthropists, listen to what Robbie George is saying. You know how serious and important this is. You know how serious and important what the Miller Center does. Uh, we could always use your help. Thank you, all of you. Thank you, Robbie. I think this has been a wonderful conversation. My pleasure. Thank you, John. Great to be with you. I hope you are enjoying the Jack Miller Center's video series, The American Experiment. The Jack Miller Center is working hard to reinvigorate education in America's founding principles and American history at both the college level and the K-12 level. If you would like to learn more about us, please visit our website, jackmillercenter.org. Thank you.